hello everybody it's me the boss hog and we're going to be looking at my stock portfolio as of 10th of march 2022 uh, i try and do these at the end of every month but i recently have started a job where i'm very busy at the start of each month so uh, this is the 10th and actually as of today uh, we've had quite a few new subscribers recently which is awesome uh, welcome everybody uh, and people have been asking me to show my full portfolio the way I do this, these videos is basically I, I walk through a couple of summaries, you know, the changes, uh, some graphs, uh, some dividends, uh, and then, you know, the last third ish to a half of the video will be um, showing individual positions. I've got 30 of them currently of uh, the companies that I hold. And I'm going to go into a bit more detail than I usually do on this video, uh, just because I'm aware we do have quite a few new people and uh, I like to be as transparent as possible. So pretty red this month. You're going to see why it does have some mitigations and I'm sure everyone's feeling it as well. But my portfolio has been pretty savaged over the last month. So anyway, without further ado, let's do it. All right, so here it is. Uh, I started in November 20, but we've got a rolling year here and I use Google Docs for this. Um, I We have three active accounts and um, two ISAs, one for my wife and one for me. These are very tax efficient investment accounts that um, British people have access to. Um, and then we, I have a general investment account as well. The reason for me not putting everything into an ISA is because you can only uh, put in 20,000 per person per year. My wife has one, I, I have one and we look to max them out and uh, have done for the last two tax years effectively. A uh, new tax year starts in early April uh, when we'll be able to add more into that. <clears throat> uh, so I've highlighted yellow here the uh, the last two months. Uh, February is closed obviously, March is still active so that figure could definitely change. Uh, obviously a couple of dreadful months. <clears throat> um, it's a bit funny because, you know, like if you look back at a month on the previous video, it had sort of Feb to date. So I had like Feb until the 10th. And at the moment in time, it was looking pretty good. It was like up two and a half thousand. The world wasn't a war or whatever we're calling it currently. Uh, and things were going along fairly fine. Now, <laughs> at the moment, I have unrealized losses for Evraz and Polymetal. These are London listed, but Russian focused miners. Polymetal especially was meant to be my gold and silver hedge. Uh, that definitely hasn't worked because that's down 90%. Uh, Evraz is my iron ore play and likewise that's down about 80% at the moment. So uh, I'm sitting on unrealized losses in those two companies. I'm really not enjoying the um, commodities boom that maybe other people are, uh, including oil, <laughs> uh, sorry, oil and um, gold and iron ore. So very unhelpful. Uh, I put here like my portfolio is unhelpfully weighted. Basically, I, I don't have anything currently in oil or gas, no defense stocks. I'm overweighted in sort of uh, tech and um, consumer discretionary spending. We'll see details a bit later. Uh, but I just have a very poor portfolio for a war, uh, effectively. So a SOS law, I guess I could be more diversified. Uh, I still kind of believe in my portfolio um, and the companies I've been buying. I, I have been sort of reviewing it as, you know, my portfolio has been bleeding. Um, and other than the Russian shares, um, I have been continuing to buy and will continue to buy. I've decided not to uh, average down on my Russian shares just because I think there's genuine risk that they could delist from London. Uh, and my free broker doesn't have access to the Moscow Stock Exchange, right? So I'd basically be a full seller. Uh, so I've decided to limit my exposure. You know, obviously if they, they recover, then great. If not, then I'm not throwing more uh, good money after bad. So that's how I feel. Uh, so hopefully here this uh, data is clear. It should all reconcile, by the way. Uh, I sort of used to design spreadsheets for a living. Uh, so I feel reasonably comfortable around Google Docs. Uh, you can see here my unrealized position, uh, which is what you know shows on trading two on two. My brokerage is particularly nasty. And the way that I look at it, I'm basically down 23,000 in just over a month. So considering my portfolio was at 110,000, uh, it's currently in 93. Uh, so I guess it's recovered a little bit, uh, but you know, the, the highest my portfolio has been was like close to 116,000 uh, into month though. So it doesn't really show here. Um, and then, yeah, now to look at this, it feels uh, a little bit depressing. Um, saying that though, I am actually surprisingly calm, especially I wasn't really sure how I'd react once my portfolio itself turned red, right? It's all very well playing with house money. Um, that's fine. Uh, but now it's actually my own capital that we're eating into. Uh, so I wondered how I'd feel with that, but honestly, I'm kind of surprised with myself. I feel quite calm. You know, I reviewed my holdings, relatively sanguine about it. Um, we're just going to trust the process. I know other people are bleeding probably to a lesser degree than me at the moment, but still. Um, and, you know, I, I think this is kind of part of the part, uh, process, really. And I've been 
saying for many months, you know, oh, you know, I missed the uh, the big uh, COVID dip. Uh, shares seem expensive. You know, actually, I'd kind of like a pullback just so I can start buying. Like, this is great in a way. Uh, I just have to kind of be brave and push through that. So that's the approach at the moment. And honestly, other than kind of checking my portfolio less often than I did before, um, I feel mostly OK. And again, I, I get excited when I'm able to pick up shares, you know, for less than I would be willing to pay for them. So that feels pretty good. So uh, it is interesting, though. And uh, yeah, if anyone else is feeling similar, uh, let me know how are you coping with it, etc. And uh, hopefully uh, we'll get through it together. Um, anyway, that's a high level summary. Let's have a look at some graphs. All right. <clears throat> so we'll start with the top left here, profit over time. I started doing um, day end closes in January 21. So this is basically showing 14 months worth of day end closes and where it sits. And you can probably pinpoint there on that top left graph exactly when Russia invaded Ukraine. Uh, that is at the middle of February. Uh, I think it was the 14th. And it just you can see the damage it done there. So, that, you know, that basically mirrors the minus 2000 uh, across. Now, interestingly, on my US holdings, I'm actually up. Uh, this is my remember, this, these aren't just active positions. These are sold positions as well. So my total profit from buys and sells. Um, so it's a bit sad to see that in case, by the way, you're wondering why it's flatlining uh, at the start of each month. I basically program my Google Docs to sort of keep a track of the day and closes. So this is sort of flat because for the rest of March, you know, it's waiting to be populated as the days go on. So hence that flat line there at the end is just time. Uh, top right here, this is actually a graph. It, I call it, I mean, it's time weighted. Um, so because of the fact we're adding capital quite a lot, so it's important to time weight it. And again, this is a bit brutal. It's something where I was really pleased with my performance. And I guess I still am pleased, you know, stripping out the last month. Um, because, you know, a month ago, uh, within February, um, I was ahead like quite comfortably, right, uh, of both the S&P 500 benchmark and the FTSE 350, um, whereas now I'm behind because of because of everything. So that that's a little bit depressing to look at, I have to say, because, again, I was like priding myself so much and I'm a year into investing. I'm outperforming the index is great. Uh, this is why you spend time uh, making these videos and doing research and everything else. Um, and, you know, actually, I'm a bit of a bargain hunter, so it's exciting to me to find something that maybe the market hasn't realized the potential of yet, jump on it and then see that in the numbers. Uh, and obviously, that's not what this is showing. Uh, hopefully, we'll recover. I do expect like similar. You can sort of see here as well in the top right graph. I had a big dip. Uh, that was in, I think it was November or maybe it was October when the variant was announced. And again, because my uh, portfolio has lots of travel, consumer discretionary stocks in, I crashed really hard. But then I rebounded a lot hot, a lot better than the other indexes did. Um, so that's also interesting. So I'm kind of hoping likewise to rebound a little bit. Although, again, I'm expecting my Russian holdings to be sort of an anchor for months, uh, if not longer, to recover from, yeah, again, that nine grand uh, unrealized position at the moment. Uh, bottom left is my overall portfolio value uh, by month. So the 93,266, this will be the figures on the uh, previously. Um, so again, this has gone down quite a lot. Uh, I am adding money, but not a huge amount between January and March. Um, that's mainly because me and my wife treated ourselves. We had an anniversary, a holiday, etc. Uh, and also we don't have a ton of spare money and we're kind of um, saving it for when the tax year starts again and we can again put everything into ISAs. So that's the focus. We have added a couple of thousand though after over the last few months. You can see that from the previous table as well. Uh, so again, it just kind of shows the impact really of what's been happening with the uh, trading position. So the bottom left here shows the overall portfolio value uh, effectively. So hopefully that makes sense. Again, if anyone has any questions about any of this stuff, uh, just drop me a question below and I will do my best again to be as transparent as possible. OK, so in terms of my performance by sector, um, when I first started, I had these notions that I'd basically operate like a fund manager, you know, and have like 5% in X and 10% in Y and et cetera, et cetera. I realized very quickly that especially because I like trading and I'd like to seek value, that doesn't really work for me. Uh, so what it does mean is like sometimes my pie looks very standard and sometimes it looks really wonky. And right now I would say it looks really wonky. Uh, no two ways about it. Like for me, I think there's some value in tech at the moment. There's some value in consumer discretionary. Transportation probably looks a bit odd if you're a new subscriber, but I've had this as high as 26% and that's because my largest holding is a coach company. Uh, so um, that 17% is basically one company, uh, or I guess mostly one company. So uh, yeah, we'll see. 
um, how that goes. Uh, but yeah, I did do a bit of trimming. I got up to actually 44 shares or 44, 45, I think actually active positions last month, but I closed out a lot of my smaller holdings just, you know, where I had like 0.1 share just to monitor it uh, and decided to again, consolidate as much as I could. Uh, I would say the notable changes month on month. So my financials have increased. Uh, that's caused by T row. I've just been buying it. I've kind of been buying it under 150, under 145, under 140, et cetera, and following it down. I'm down about 2% on it at the moment, so that feels fine. Then legal in general, they released reliably solid results. I really like UK insurers. I think there's good value in almost all of them. Likewise with Aviva have announced, you know, their conclusion of their turnaround plan, solid numbers again, not quite as good as um, legal in generals, um, but you know, Aviva is a much improved business from a turnaround. So I like, I like those as well. Uh, technology wise, I've been, Probably my strongest conviction actually at the moment is Amcor. Uh, this is a semiconductor play that trades on a you know less than eight uh, current PE. Uh, it's investing in new factories. I really liked their management presentation. Their year end results were solid. Um, you know, and it's kind of like this year I wanted, I, I was saying uh, again, for anyone who's new, I'm really targeting those kind of like small to medium kind of companies, you know, for American companies, I view that as like 3 billion to maybe 20 billion. Uh, for UK companies, it's kind of anywhere from half a billion to maybe 5 billion, something like that. So, you know, being able to buy these kind of like growth companies to me is, is exciting. And I think, you know, there's opportunities there. Um, you know, my best performing share so far was Huntsman Corporation and Amcor in some ways reminds me of that, even like, um, you know, the, the way that they were going through this journey where they were moving into higher margin areas, investing in factories, et cetera, et cetera. And again, eventually um, Huntsman went from, you know, $24 up to, I think it was about $40. Uh, I sold out between 32 and 36. It seems I sold out too early, but I was happy with that exit, honestly. Um, and likewise with Amcor here, I think it should be in the mid 30s. So the fact you can buy this share at $21, I think is great value. Uh, so I've been putting a lot of money into that. Uh, then my consumer discretionary, uh, these are all UK holdings. So Hollywood Bowl, I think the name, the clues in the name really, it's a bowling company that's um, very resilient, managed to make a profit despite COVID for the last couple of years. I'm expecting a return to normal this year. And so I've been buying shares on what I think will be about 13 PE. Uh, so that feels really good. Games Workshop, this it has historically been a very expensive share, but now actually because they released what was seen as disappointing results, didn't think they were that bad, but yeah, some challenges with like logistics and costs and stuff. They're now trading on a P of like 17. And I think for such an incredibly efficient business, when you look at the financial measures, as well as the growth opportunities and what I think is quite a compelling product, um, I'm really happy buying Games Workshop at these levels. I, I would buy Games Workshop under under 100 pounds the fact i can pick it up for 65 to me just seems crazy so i've been significantly buying more games workshop and fever tree likewise this is a company i bought and traded actually in the past quite successfully between 19 and 24 pounds uh, i've i've now got quite a large position at, at about 18 pounds so i'm down sort of a few percent on this at the moment but i feel really good about it definitely significant cost pressures with this business but i just really like the main revenue drivers uh, i've done a video on fever tree um, but, you know, really happy to buy uh, and likewise uh, or not likewise. <clears throat> so those are my uh, increases in positions and then my decreases. I decided to ditch my REITs. I mostly did that to move into financials um, because, you know, I basically view them as similarly defensive, uh, specifically insurance companies. I view them as similarly defensive and an opportunity to pick up sort of seven, eight percent yields. And I sort of viewed them as having similar upside. Uh, probably Vicky was my toughest sell because, you know, I basically sold out for like plus 4%. Um, not bad for a couple of months holding, but hardly great because I do think Vicky is undervalued. But I sold out to buy um, Phoenix, uh, who actually I probably should include here as well. Uh, and by the time you're watching this, I will have included it. Uh, but, you know, Phoenix is a FTSE 100 uh, insurance company as well. And... Um, Again, it's it's just a clear buy for me with a, a whacking great big dividend. Uh, actually, its results are on the 14th of March, so I might be eating humble pie next week, but we'll see. Um, I, I think there's a lot of value there, so I decided to ditch Vicky in favor of Phoenix. Uh, and likewise, healthcare. Again, I don't think there's anything wrong with Bristol Myers, but I took the opportunity to sell it, buy into things like Bowl and Fever Tree, uh, and basically, again, the, these are kind of targeting my kind of small to mid good growth. Um, and so, again, it was just ticking a lot of boxes. I decided to move um, out of BMY. Don't think there's anything wrong with BMY. I got like a $68.5 sale price for most of the remaining shares, about 200, I think, on my last batch. Um, definitely some upside there. 
uh, and you know, I, I think it makes a lot of sense to own it also. But for me, I just uh, decided to, to move it elsewhere. So they, those have been the biggest movements. Um, and yeah, right now I will very much accept that this pie looks extremely wonky uh, for those reasons. So fair enough. Uh, anyway, let's have a look at the dividend. All right, so as it's discovering Feb and March, I've included there a breakdown of all the dividends I received on the right, uh, then the summary by month and year on the left, and then how that looks as a graph in the middle right, standard stuff, I think. Uh, so first of all, a solid February, but it was almost entirely led by BMY, so that's definitely not going to be repeating, um, so that's a bit of a shame. Uh, so March has got off to actually a really good start, and Games Workshop is fairly rare in the UK as a quarterly dividend payer. That's definitely not standard like it is in the US. Most UK companies have a final and an interim dividend, um, so you know twice a year basically. So um, actually, it's nice to have Games Workshop. What I would what I would say is that I'm not expecting. Um, March to be a particularly great month uh, and it's going to be a lot lower than last year because last year I got a special from Tesco I know this there's a TSCO for tractor supply in America but this is the UK TSCO for Tesco supermarket so I got a big special dividend last year um, which obviously won't be repeating so uh, that accounts for most of that uh, and also now because my portfolio is um, more UK weighted especially where I'm focusing on kind of those dividend stocks like Phoenix like the insurers uh, etc uh, again I'm expecting to have really great kind of like May and October periods and less good quarterly so I'm expecting that to translate into the graphs after we go through the year I'm sort of expecting to have much better April and May and then September and October which is you know again more typical from UK uh, payers and a lot of my U US positions aren't big dividend payers right so again I, I think that's gonna be the case for the next year basically is what we should be expecting to see here so I've picked out Phoenix and Gamma Phoenix has like an eight and a half percent yield currently and um, you know that probably is indicative of the share price being too low because uh, it's quite cash generative now uh, which is great uh, and Gamma I would describe this as a UK telecoms company um, have quite a big holding in as you'll see in a second uh, they are what i would describe as a very stereotypical dividend growth company they've been growing their dividend between 11 and 15 percent for years um, but currently their ratio isn't particularly massive uh, in terms of the sorry their dividend yield isn't particularly massive by the way neither is their payout ratio because they're growing faster than that increase in dividend so it's actually been going down as the payout ratio so I just think Gamma is really a very good example of a dividend growth company, if that's your thing. Uh, and by the way, I think Gamma is super cheap at the moment for a stock as well. So, uh, but yeah, so that's a dividend position. Uh, so it was nice to get that from Games Workshop. That quarterly dividend now is enough to buy a share at current price. So that's what I'm going to be doing with my Games Workshop moving forward. Just basically reinvesting it and buying a, a share every quarter is going to feel really good. Uh, so yeah. Uh, so that, that's all the summaries now. We're going to spend the next half of the video on the uh, positions that I have active in my portfolio. So let's do that now. All right, so now the good stuff. Uh, this looks pretty red, I appreciate. Uh, before we get into the details, just a quick mention on the method. This is showing my active 30 positions, but the profit shows both realized and unrealized positions. So if you're looking at like Apple, for example, and wondering how I have a 1,400 pound profit on a 46 pound holding, that's because the 46 pound is my active holding currently. Whereas in the past, I obviously owned a lot more shares and was you know uh, profitable when I owned them. So that that's the reason why there. Obviously, I also have other positions that I've closed out entirely like i mentioned huntsman earlier right i made like four and a half thousand pounds on those but they're not going to show on here because i don't have an active position in them at the moment so that that's basically what this what this shows uh okay so <clears throat> pretty red i guess in mitigation um i'm a pretty active trader so i don't really sit on kind of like big green positions you know i look to kind of redeploy that elsewhere maybe that's a failure of mine i'm not sure uh, i guess in the long run we'll find out uh, so it just means that i haven't really had like a situation where i had you know 100 percent green and it's gradually fallen back but i'm still green it's just not really the case um, obviously as well i got absolutely hammered on everaz and polymetal here you can see them in the top right in both instances so everaz i'm down 2.3k polymetal 5.6 the only reason why everaz isn't even higher is because in the past i traded them quite successfully and i made about 1500 pound in realized profit so when i speak about the 9k unrealized position in both that's really the delta it's my kind of previous profit from everaz but obviously right now that looks super bad so uh, and then i would also say that some of my positions uh, you know you'll see here for like gamma Games Workshop, Genius uh, as well. These are pretty red. <clears throat> uh, and to be honest with you, I just got into them too quickly. Uh, but Gamma and Games Workshop especially are really great businesses. Um, 
Genius is still a bit unproven, but well, uh, for me, um, I guess I'll start with them actually. So this is a company that started life as a SPAC, um, but didn't really start life as a SPAC because they have a profitable European operation, um, but their US kind of big expansion was a SPAC. So, you know, you have this existing business uh, that was bought and then they're, they're more or less using their profitable existing business to build scale in America. Now, I probably did get into this a little bit too quickly because I'm like quite passionate about what it does, which is kind of you know, big data gambling sports. Uh, and that, that kind of ticks a lot of kind of big interest boxes for me. And I, I think the product's really good actually. Um, but I just got in there too quickly too soon. And, and it's a bit of a shame because I actually sold, you know, I was selling down Huntsman to buy this. And, and again, I was fine selling out of Huntsman. I'd, I'd hit my price target and, you know, plus 50% always feels good in about six months. Um, so it wasn't that, it was just the fact that, like I probably moved too fast. <clears throat> now, in fairness, I went on an on a, um, earnings call and company presentation update day at the end of January for Genius, and I really got the business. Like they really explained how the European uh, was basically subsidizing the US growth. This is when profit's gonna happen, et cetera, et cetera. Recommend it to anyone who's interested in the business. It really kind of sold me on it. And I actually, it was then I took the decision to average down. My buy price here is like eight and a half dollars and the share price is five dollars. So I'm definitely pretty red on this, but <clears throat> I don't have any existential problems anymore, basically, or concerns with this business. So I will be still buying this at these kind of levels, um, even though I already have quite a big position. Yes, yeah, some more speculative, but again, there's there's profitable business there. And at the moment, they're building scale uh, into America. So that that feels absolutely fine. Um, OK, so I'll go back to National Express, which is my largest holding, um, and it has been for some time. It was even bigger, you know, at sort of 26 um, percent at one stage, I think it was up to. Uh, so I did have 10,000 shares. I've currently got 6,000. Um, the reason why this is my largest holding is I just think the market fundamentally misunderstands it as a business, which I know might sound like really ballsy from like, you know, some rando on the Internet. Um, but the reason I think this is because I think it's overly seen as a COVID stock. Like, yeah, of course it's impacted, but it doesn't go across um, borders, even though it's in multiple countries. The people who use it kind of have to use it. Um, and it's well diversified, well managed. Um, a lot of its contracts are also recurring. So it gets something like 70% of its revenues from recurring, which are contracted and committed by sort of state and um, local government. So again, it, it was able to kind of keep its earnings relatively high, even during COVID. Uh, it was also able to buy distressed businesses during COVID, uh, some good case studies where it sort of um, turned those businesses around. They have a strategy called land and expand, right? So they'll go into a city, buy a distressed business or win a contract, and then they'll look to kind of expand what they do in that city, right? So they do like trams, buses, coaches, school buses, work, travel, you know, that that kind of stuff. Um, they released results this week, actually pretty solid. The market liked them. Um, yeah, no, no, uh, no particularly exciting fireworks. But again, I think that kind of says a lot about the revenue model for the business. So, um, you know, they're even before these earnings, their um, their their profit was already back to sort of pre COVID levels, just their revenue wasn't. And again, that's indicative of a company that's becoming more profitable, not less. Uh, so really good. They've got a great like five year strategy. So I will be holding probably at least 5,000 shares for the next few years. I probably won't have these when I retire. Um, but, you know, to me, this is like a 2025 to 27 kind of holding when, you know, that delivers. Um, in their update, they mentioned that they would be looking to reinstate their dividend in 2022, which is what I was expecting. The one um, maybe dark cloud for National Express is that they wanted to buy a, a stagecoach, a, a bus company. Uh, but it was held up by um, regulators. And then whilst they were reviewing that, a German company came in, offered 35 percent more to Stagecoach than National Express was. And of course, Stagecoach said, yeah, thanks very much for that. Uh, and to me, that's such a premium that I just don't see how National Express can come back with a counter offer like without grossly overpaying. Like I think National Express had a fine offer for Stagecoach. Um, but it doesn't really need Stagecoach. The, the real win it was getting with Stagecoach was the infrastructure, the fact that Stagecoach has a lot of like depots, particularly in cities, uh, that National Express could use for things like work, um, shuttle buses and stuff. Uh, so yeah, it's probably gonna grow a little bit less slowly, but it's still a very profitable business. Uh, and likewise as well, it kind of hedges um, its oil. 
So currently it's actually paying less for oil this year than it was last year, even though, you know, the whole thing with Russia has kicked off, of course, driving oil prices up uh, because of the way that this company is responsible and hedges uh, over two years in advance. It hasn't really been impacted by this. So, again, no impact on earnings or immediate earnings and also maybe quite rarely and worth highlighting this company has excellent industrial relations it's something that like you know they record you know oh we won this business look at the difference in strike days before and after we took over right it, it pays the living wage in the uk so not the minimum wage they have to pay there's something called a living wage which is really great as well so it's more um you know it is basically a good employer so if you like those kind of like esg measures it's really good as well on like reducing accidents those kind of things as well. So it's just a really well run solid business that I think is misunderstood by the market. Um, and I think there's a lot of upside here. So again, I, I will buy this under 240. Uh, I have a target price of 320. Um, so yeah, uh, Gamma is a telecoms company. I work in the telecoms industry. I think um, it's a solid business. I'm not really quite sure why it took such a battering after its last results, which were in line with expectations. It has traded on a fairly chunky multiple because it is such a well-run and scalable business that it's built. Um, and also, like, it's not an incumbent player, so it doesn't have any of the legacy garbage. Um, it's actually like you know, incredibly modern and nimble and, and in, in, in certain areas like SIP traffic. So, you know, usage over the Internet and IP in general, uh, it's the largest provider in the UK, like much bigger than uh, BT, who, you know, are very slow moving because they've got all their old assets to sweat. Uh, so it's now a multinational company it's expanding into Europe. And I think it, it like I say, it's just a very good dividend growth play for anyone who's interested in telecoms exposure. I think it's really underpriced at the moment. And even though I'm on the upper end of analyst estimates, about £24 a share, I actually think I know this business well enough uh, that I feel comfortable taking that position. Uh, so we'll see how that works out. Uh, next up, Games Workshop. Uh, so this is a company that has also historically been very expensive because it has incredible financial performances and has been growing really well. It has had some pressures recently with its logistics and cost <clears throat> as it grows internationally. And the results were a bit disappointing from that perspective. Um, <clears throat> what was really great, though, was that their IP work has really started to kick off. And I think maybe Games Workshop were a little bit slow to realize just how powerful their IP could truly be. So they've started to sort of license their their IP uh, for things like games. There's a script in the work right um, for uh, for a show. Um, <clears throat> it's all starting to feed in. So although their results sort of for their physical products sowed a lot of pressure on the margins last time, actually the, the real kind of shining light <clears throat> was uh, their IP stuff. So that, that was cool for me. Uh, and I basically, you know, I had a big read. I've done a video on them. Um, it's clear that they need to work on their website, on their logistics, on their cost management, etc. But I mean, like, there's a lot of investment going into the business if you read between the lines. They've traditionally actually had a very heavy um, physical presence in stores because their products are very expensive. So they basically rely on real uh, experts in the store who are paid extremely well by retail standards, right? I'm talking like 30 grand a year kind of uh, retail here because they're expected to be super knowledgeable and kind of get people vested into it. What is an expensive hobby? Um, so that means, though, that their, their online presence has been a bit weak. Uh, and likewise, as they've expanded, you know, they didn't have enough warehouse space, uh, shipping costs were higher than they thought they were going to be, et cetera, et cetera. But there's a really great business here. And, I, um, you know, right now, the, the current PE is something like 17. Uh, and considering I believe that they're going to be earning more as they work through these problems and grow, that means their future PE is maybe going to be like 14, 15. And I just think for such a great business, I'm really happy to buy shares at like 65 pounds, which is what I've been buying them at. I'd be actually happy to buy sort of at £100 for this company. I still think even at £100, it would be 20% undervalued. So needless to say, I'm putting my money where my mouth is, even though it looks really red at the moment. Again, I have no worries about this as a long-term investment at all. Again, obviously, I wish I was more patient, but without a crystal ball, what can you do? Um, and the other company I'm actually really um, keen on is Amcor. So this is a semiconductor play that trades at a PE of less than eight. Uh, really great year end results. I was on the earnings call. Um, CEO really seemed like he knew what he was talking about. CFO likewise was capable. Um, she was good too. Uh, but really, this is just the business that's really getting its act together. And it's kind of got to that stage where it's starting to achieve scale. So historically, maybe the margins weren't quite where you wanted them to be. But now they've got to the point where they're really starting to go great on earnings. They're expanding in sort of, I think it's Vietnam, but kind of low risk Asian place 
places in response to sort of consumer demand. They may well also be a winner if the uh, sort of geopolitical situation gets a bit more tense uh, because it's an American company. Um, and, you know, I just I think it's investing in all the right areas. It's obviously like in growth areas anyway. Um, and it just seems really good. And again, it ticks my box for kind of like, yeah, you know, that that's a company that I uh, want to own that's kind of small to medium, already profitable and about to become significantly more profitable, I believe. So we'll see. Genius, we've spoken about Phoenix. This is a um, insurance company in the UK. I just think it's a little bit complicated for a business because it primarily does like life insurance, end of life pension management. So the way it has to kind of um, account for liabilities is a little bit um, capital intensive, but actually it's now built such a kind of reputation that more or less it keeps buying sort of like life insurance books from other um, insurance companies notably Swiss Re and Aberdeen, who previously had large holdings in the company. Swiss Re has exited its position entirely. Aberdeen sold a third of its position, although retains a 10% share. And also now that um, the UK has left the EU, uh, the uh, UK government announced it was going to relax um, capital requirements for insurance companies. So they'll be able to free up literally billions uh, to spend on sort of housing, rents, uh, kind of long term infrastructure payback. So all of the insurance companies in the UK will benefit from this. But I believe that because Phoenix is specialised in end of life, it will benefit even more because it has to keep more capital um, on its books as a result of that, basically. Uh, and likewise, I just think this is a significantly improved business over the last couple of years that's made some really great acquisitions that have been quite chunky, but actually seemingly they've integrated them really nicely. So this is like my main insurance play, although I have also been buying legal in general, which is just such a great diversified, well-run company. Like for anyone who doesn't know legal in general, imagine like the Johnson & Johnson of the insurance world or like the kind of financial management world. It's just a really beautifully diversified company. The return on assets is solid. Everything about it is solid, including the yield. And honestly, I just don't think you could go wrong. Like, I don't understand why you'd buy a bond, just buy legal and general shares, right? Like that that's kind of how I view legal in general. Aviva is kind of, again, a, a bit different, but another insurance play. Uh, for me, this is a turnaround opportunity, but that's living there as well. T row, I, again, I'm down just 40 quid now, actually, but this ended up a bigger stake than I was originally expecting at 4%. Although you can see there's a big drop off there in my um, portfolio weighting between Phoenix at 8% and T row at 4 um again I, I appreciate that this is going to be a company that has exposure to the wider sentiment but it just seems like a really solid company that's trading way below its five-year averages and so i've just been buying it basically it's just a nicely diversified company fever tree i think i've spoken about them already so i'm not going to speak about them more alphabet we know amazon we know s4 probably isn't familiar to most people but this is kind of a marketing a uh, company, but like a modern marketing company does a lot of like digital stuff. Um, but specifically, this is kind of a play on an individual being Martin Sorrell, who uh, is a self-made billionaire, I think, actually, but a self-made businessman who is a marketing expert. So it's really a play on that. Crichton's is an interesting one because this is one of the smaller companies I own. I think it might actually be the smallest company I own. Tiny market cap, like 60 million. Um, Trades on a pretty small uh, multiple. It is profitable, um, just a few million, as you'd expect with a market cap of 60. Um, but I think it's been under pressure because it performed very well during COVID, right? Like it's uh, sort of hand gels and stuff. But actually, again, it's kind of got a war chest. It's made a couple of really good acquisitions in terms of like branding. It's striking agreements to get its products into more supermarkets. And actually, considering I'm not really that into like this, these products personally, uh, it's like posh soap, right? Um, it's a really cool little business. And again, I think actually they have a really credible management team for such a small business. I, I just like what I'm seeing. Um, and again, I think it's a, a, a fun business to own. The, the buy sell spreads on these some of these really small companies are brutal as, uh, you know, people have never been in penny shares might not realize. But uh, so actually, again, like here, I, I'm actually kind of more or less flat, but where the buy sell spread is so high, you know, if I was to sell currently, I just wouldn't get the uh, the same kind of money back. So what can you do? Uh, Ceridian is definitely a company that most people won't have heard of. It's only about a quarter of a billion market cap, but it's it's so up my street, it's ridiculous. Like um, this is a telco company that specializes in billing and CRM software, which is basically my day job. Uh, so I have uh, an extremely 
strong opinion about this company. I think they've basically built a superb, really superb um, product that scales lovely. They basically have taken a modular approach to what's called business support systems or BSS. So it makes it very easy for a company to just take one of those modules, right? Like if you need a rating engine or an invoicing platform, or if you need you know, a CRM platform, maybe provisioning integration, you can just buy modules, plug them in, and it just like connects and gradually, but surely you end up with like more and more of a managed service. Uh, so again, very profitable. Yes, it's taken them a little while to build this, but this is a company that's been going for 30 years and basically getting better and better. Uh, CEO still owns 30% of it. So you can see that as a good or a bad thing, depending on how you feel about it. So the free float is quite slow when you put in an order. Uh, but I really like this company. I'm, I, I, this is potentially going to end up a big conviction for me next year. Um, just because I think the share should be about nine pounds a share. And last I looked, it was like six and a half quid. So I think, again, there's a real big disconnect here. Common Sachs, I won't go into, ever as fine. Red Row is a house builder that's basically changing its business model. So it's kind of a turnaround, if that's quite the right word. But historically, it built kind of expensive houses in the southeast of England, where it's a very slow planning permission, very expensive. Um, you know, and not many units. It's basically moving into other cities and the suburbs. <clears throat> so instead, what I'm expecting to happen here is actually its revenue may well decrease, but its profitability, especially its percentages, will increase so that they'll sell more units, but at lower cost. So depending on exactly what that looks like, we'll see. But it should basically mean that they'll have a faster turnaround of properties and ultimately better margins. So I, I like the direction of travel here. It's not the largest or the most well known of the UK house builders. Um, you know, you could definitely go for like uh, Persimmon and Barrett here, but I liked Red Row for the turnaround. Yeah, I'm a bit of a sucker for a bargain as you might be starting to realize. Uh, and for me, Red Row just seemed like it represented good value. Polymetal, yeah, a meta, yeah, fine. Uh, I, I sort of like held my nose a little bit when I bought meta because I'm not a, a um, Facebook user. I just seemed like, again, this was like a P of 17. Maybe I'll regret it, you know, if like Facebook aren't able to move into metaverse and, you know, the advertising restrictions continue to bite. You know, basically for Meta, like I'm very much expecting that on the next earnings result, I'm going to feel really good because it's profitable or I'm going to ditch it. That's it's going to be one of those situations. Right. And again, I'll be like, damn, it was actually a bad investment because those challenges are going to take longer to resolve if at all. Right. It's it's clearly under pressure at the moment. Um, but that said, I think there is still like, this is a huge business that's still very profitable. Uh, it's just a case of what you think the business is worth. Right. Scottish Morgan Investment Trust this is an ETF that mainly specializes in US tech stocks. So guess what's happened to that? Uh, Kanos is an interesting one. This is like a, an IT company, uh, very specialized in sort of um, digital transformation. I guess that's like a bit of a buzzword, but it effectively goes in with like project managers and BAs and those kind of people and basically automates, uh, standardizes, puts processes in place, etc. So fine. Uh, Lloyd's is... Um, a UK focused bank. It's often considered a bellwether for the UK economy more broadly. I think it's got to the level where it's a solid buy with a solid dividend. Uh, it's now actually a much improved business compared to sort of 2008 when it had to be part nationalized. Uh, you know, and I think it's fairly uh, defensive and standard. And for me, I'm imagining this is going to be a short term hold. I'm kind of buying in for like 45B and would look to sell at sort of 55. You know, I'd be more than happy with a 20% profit for this company. Legal and general talks I've spoken about, Aviva I've spoken about. Dot Digital is a um, sort of mailing specialist. So it does sort of, um, you know, very customized um, mass distribution, emails, uh, marketing campaigns, that kind of stuff. Uh, it's been benefiting from sort of wider movements uh, in the industry to sort of customize messages. It's got some cool stuff. Um, it released results that were maybe a bit disappointing. Um, but the share price massively overreacted. So I decided to average down on this actually. Microsoft is there. Danaher is kind of like a, a bit of a speculative play for me. So we'll see, but it's basically high end medical grade stuff. Uh, Apple we know about, and I think Vicky we know about. So anyway, this video is really long and I think actually my uh, it's time to wake up and feed my daughter. Uh, so let's go. All right, and we're back. Sorry to end the uh, portfolio uh, overview there a bit abruptly. Uh, my daughter is teething and waking up at about 2 to 3 a.m. every night. So uh, that's my job for this evening. Uh, and uh, that's now been sorted. So, um, yeah, I, um, I think that we wrapped it up nicely enough uh, in terms of that walkthrough. If anyone has any questions, again, um, 
shoot me a comment um i'm more than happy to answer again it's not the best looking portfolio it's ever been and if i'm honest it's probably the worst it's been um but uh we're just persevering basically and like i say i feel a little bit like when i look at my portfolio but i also kind of am aware that this is the exact time to be buying companies right so uh, I won't lie that I haven't been doing like more reading up on some of my more speculative or smaller holdings, just kind of making sure that I still believe in the businesses. Um, but actually I do. And therefore I feel really good about the opportunity to buy uh, cheaper. And ultimately I hope that these kind of prices continue or maybe even get worse uh, in April when, you know, again, we can start taking advantage of those tax efficient accounts uh, again. So that's uh, that's sort of how I'm feeling at the moment. Maybe a little bit beaten up, but kind of like, uh, understanding the process and kind of optimistic that this is a great buying opportunity. So uh, trying to weigh that up basically. Um, yeah, otherwise, uh, hopefully that was of interest to people, especially if you're new, like I said, look to do these once a month and uh, be fully transparent, including accepting where I've made mistakes, which I've definitely done. Um, and trying to improve from them. So uh, I welcome any feedback likewise. Uh, otherwise, thank you very much for watching. It's an incredibly long video. Uh, I've been the Boss Hog and good luck for your investing. Bye for now, everyone.